Every year, around half of the NBA will enter free agency. At the same time, you have rookies coming in, players from other leagues, players making return, and about 50 to 100 players you don't see from last year move on to the next year. Now, for the most part, most of the guys who we will never see again on the NBA court are just fringe talents who probably you wouldn't even notice and honestly weren't really NBA talents to begin with. But there's always some older guys who have been around for a while who for the first time will find themselves in free agency all season long. Today, I wanted to talk about one of those guys whose absence from the league is going to be felt. I wanted to reflect on his career, both the highs and the lows, and ultimately ask the question that everyone's thinking. Is LaMarcus Aldridge a Hall of Famer? We're going to go through his entire career, but before we get started, please like the video before you forget. It really does help me out more than I think you guys realize. So sit back, relax, this is going to be a long one. Aldridge was born and raised in Texas and played his high school ball at Seagaville High School located in Dallas. Here he shined thanks to his massive stature and impressive skill set from an early age. At 6 foot 11 inches, Aldridge was tied with three other guys as the second tallest top 50 high school recruit in the nation back in 2004. And this was at the time where such size and skill set was still a hot commodity as low post scoring remained a crucial part of the game. Aldridge, being ranked as the number 13 recruit in the nation and the fifth best center, was a major NCAA target. And this was a time where high school kids could go straight to the NBA. For example, Dwight Howard, the number one recruit from this class, went straight to the league. This was a legitimate option for Aldridge. And he did initially have his name entered in the draft class, but ultimately, in part thanks to the words of advice of a prime Shaquille O'Neal, Aldridge opted to take the college path. NBA Hall of Famer and general world icon Shaq was also considered a sure thing for the NBA after his senior year of high school. But at the time, back in the early 90s, it just wasn't a thing to go straight to the league out of high school. Sure, technically, Reggie Harding was the pioneer of the prep to pro route way back in 1962, but you could count on one hand the amount of guys that had done that. It wasn't until 1995 when Kevin Garnett paved the way as being the first modern era prep to pro player. From 1995 for the next 11 years, 39 players would make the jump from high school to the NBA, and for a majority of them, it proved to be a profound mistake. Shaq saw this trend and as a result was pretty much always one to discourage teenagers from entering the NBA. Like I said, Aldridge took his advice and went to the University of Texas to join the nationally famous Texas Longhorns. During his first year with the Longhorns, they entered the season with a lot of hype to their name. And they opened up that year very strong, dominating their non-conference schedule. But when they switched to the Big 12 season, that is when things got pretty tough. Overall, Texas finished the year 20-11, but only 9-7 in the Big 12. They lost in the first round of the conference tournament, and then lost in the first round of the NCAA tournament. It was a bit embarrassing, but looking back, we see Aldridge managed to only appear in 16 of the possible 33 games, so he must have been hurt, so I'm going to definitely excuse this. During his freshman year, even playing hurt, Aldridge held his own. He didn't dominate like a lot of people had hoped for, but 9 points, 5 rebounds, and 1.5 blocks per game is good. It, it, it's perfectly good. It's not great, but it's good. It may surprise you because nowadays top high school recruits will go one and done regardless of how poorly that one year goes in college. But Aldridge opted to remain in school for his sophomore year to prove himself and further develop his game. And this time things went a bit differently. Texas started the season with an impressive eight game winning streak led by Aldridge and this included two noteworthy wins against nationally ranked opponents. In the end, Texas managed a very impressive 25-5 overall regular season record going 13-3 in their conference, good enough for first in their conference. During their conference tournament though, Aldridge and company would face defeat in their championship matchup against Kansas. Then in the NCAA tournament, they had a little bit of success winning three games before being eliminated in the Elite Eight. Though the season did not go how they had hoped, it rarely ever does in basketball. Most teams will not win the championship after their season's done. What is important is that Aldridge proved himself to be a legitimate NBA prospect during this time in Texas. 
During his sophomore year, Aldridge's averages were 15 points, 9 rebounds, and 2 blocks per game. It was time for him to enter the league. Looking back at the 2006 NBA Draft, it was actually one of the worst ever. Only six players in the lottery ended up having long 10 plus year careers. Most of them ended up being busts. To give you an idea of the limited expectations on the draft's most highly sought after player, NBA Draft.net's best player comparison for Aldridge was a rookie Channing Fry. That being an okay paint scorer and rebounder and not much else. This was before Fry started shooting threes, by the way. Still though, even without a lot of the hype that you often see with the top lottery picks, Aldridge possessed a valuable NBA level skill set and had NBA caliber size, and being 21 rather than 19, his maturity was also appreciated. He was selected second overall by the Chicago Bulls and traded right away to the league's worst team, the Portland Trailblazers, who had only won 21 games the year prior. So this was a tremendous opportunity for Aldridge to get on the court and develop into a legitimate NBA player. After a delayed start to his rookie season due to recovering from a shoulder surgery, Aldridge quickly began making noise in the NBA. By February, he was moved into the starting center spot and performed very well there. Over the last 15 games of his rookie season, Aldridge improved all of his regular season averages to 14 points, 8 boards, and 1.6 blocks per game. However, on March 31st, a few minutes into a game against the LA Clippers, Aldridge would leave the arena due to shortness of breath and an irregular heartbeat. Ultimately, he ended up being okay, but now was given the diagnosis of having Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. To put it very simply, this is a genetic disorder that results in the electrical system of a person's heart to be a little out of whack and leads to an irregular heartbeat. The reason you don't want to have an irregular heartbeat is because it increases the likelihood of a lot of bad things happening, namely cardiac arrest or a stroke. After this medical scare, Aldridge was advised to sit out the rest of his rookie year, missing the final nine games. Ultimately, the Blazers were much better in 2007 as they managed to win 32 games and rank 12th in the conference. Aldridge's final stat line for the year was 9 points, 5 rebounds, and 1.2 blocks a night, while shooting a very impressive 50% on his twos. It was the teammate of Aldridge, Brandon Roy, who was drafted 6th overall, who would finish with the league's Rookie of the Year award, but the two of them did make the 2007 All-Rookie First Team. During the summer of 07, Aldridge was deemed healthy and able to return to basketball. As a result, he was named to the United States Select Team, whose duty was to train their actual national team in preparation for international competitions. This ended up being a tremendous opportunity for him, as in one summer, Aldridge's talents skyrocketed on the court. The 2008 NBA season was a huge step forward for the Blazers and Aldridge's development. He appeared in and started all 76 games that he played, even playing the power forward position alongside the team's starting center, Joel Prisbilla. His production ballooned to 17 points, 7 rebounds, and 1.2 blocks a night. Even while being encouraged to evolve his game a bit this year as a power forward pulling himself further and further from the hoop on his jump shots, he ended up holding his own very well and improving. The Blazers finished with 41 wins, good enough for 10th in the conference and their first season at 500 since 2004. Aldridge would finish third in the most improved player category for the league while his teammate Roy made his first all-star team that year. The future was looking very bright for the Blazers' young core. During the summer of 08, Aldridge once again was named to the United States Select Team as they tuned up for the Beijing Olympics. With another summer of valuable training under his belt, the 2009 season was expected to be a breakthrough year for the Blazers, especially when you throw in the fact they had the number one overall pick from 07, Greg Oden, finally joining them after missing what was supposed to be his first year. After a shaky start to the season for Aldridge, he and his teammates began rolling through the league. Even with Odin coming and going with injury, the Blazers finished the season on an impressive streak winning 10 of their last 11 games, with 6 of those games being 20 plus point blowouts. Aldridge once again made improvements to his all-around game as a power forward, putting up a career-high 18 points along with 7 rebounds and a block a game. He even began sprinkling in 3-point shots hitting 7 of 28 attempts in the regular season. The Blazers finished with 54 wins, their most since the year 2000, and were the fourth seed in the Western Conference. That's home court advantage. 
The first playoff run of Aldridge's career was slated to be a good one, as he, alongside now two-time All-Star Brandon Roy and rookie standout Greg Oden, were all healthy and dying to make their names known in the league. But they had a tough opponent in round one. It was the Tracy McGrady and Yao Ming-led Houston Rockets. After getting blown off the court in Game 1, the young Blazers would settle down in Game 2 and win a nail-biter, led by Roy in his 42 points, along with Aldridge in his 27. Games 3 and 4 back in Houston were tough losses to stomach, as they would lose both games by a combined 5 points. But in Game 5, do-or-die time at home, the young Blazers showed up once more and pulled away by a double figures to victory, with both Roy and Aldridge dropping 25 points apiece. But in Game 6, the Rockets' strength and veteran know-how proved to be too much as they finished off Portland. It was only six games, a first-round exit, but the league had taken notice. Aldridge managed to average 19 points, 7 rebounds, and 1.7 blocks per game in his very first-ever playoff series. A series where he was tasked with going up against the 7-foot-6-inch All-Star Yao Ming nonetheless. The Blazers and Aldridge were now a team to be reckoned with. During the summer of 2009, after another stint training with Team USA, Aldridge was awarded a massive five-year, $65 million contract by the Blazers. They also gave his teammate Roy a five-year, $80 million deal, locking the two up to be the face of their franchise for years to come. I think you know where this is going. The 2010 season started out hot for Portland. They were 12-5 through November, but injuries derailed them. First, Odin, in his second year, was off to a pretty good start, putting up 11 points, 8 boards a night. But in his 21st game, he would go down with a season-ending knee injury, which would derail the rest of his career. Then in January and February, Roy had missed significant time with a knee injury of his own. Aldridge was forced to shoulder a lot of the workload during those months, and as a result, the team did struggle mightily. In the end, Aldridge played in 78 games and managed averages of 17 points, 8 rebounds a night helping the Blazers once again reach 50 wins. A very impressive feat given the hardships their starting lineup faced along the way. Portland was seeded sixth going into the playoffs and was set to take on the Steve Nash and Amari Stoudemire-led Phoenix Suns, a high-scoring team that I actually grew up watching. We Suns fans viewed the Blazers as a hard-nosed team that would not go down without a beating. In Game 1, even without Brandon Roy, Blazers newcomer veteran Andre Miller stepped up alongside Aldridge, and they combined to drop 53 points in a stunning victory. But in games 2 and 3, the Suns blew the socks off of Portland, winning by a combined 40 points. In game 4, Roy would make his return from his latest injury, and he played better than a lot of people could have expected, as they were pretty desperate at the time. Aldridge put up 31 points, 11 rebounds, and the Blazers even the series at 2. But to suggest the return from injury from Roy may have been a little too soon was an understatement, as he played terribly in games 5 and 6, as the Suns would win those two in a row. For the second year in a row, the Blazers would lose a round 1 series in 6 games. Aldridge's averages for the series were 19 points, 6 rebounds, and 1.8 blocks a night. Though the 2010 season was a letdown, it was pretty much exclusively a result of injuries that forced it to be that way. Portland fans recognized they had a really good team, and their core was still really young. The sky was the limit entering the new decade, and people were excited to see how things were going to play out. The summer of 2010 was a bit disappointing for Aldridge, as once again, though he was invited to training camp as a select player, he would once again not make the Team USA FIBA squad, which was pretty disappointing considering he was passed up in favor of Tyson Chandler and Kevin Love, who are good players, but I think Aldridge may have deserved it a little more than one of them at least. However, moving on to the regular season, 2011 had its highs and lows. Aldridge, though he had the best season of his NBA career to date, as he managed to play 81 games while averaging career highs of 21 points, 8 rebounds, 2 assists a game with 1.2 blocks, and he shot 50% from 2, even with all that, the team went through some serious hardships. Firstly, Greg Oden missed the entire season with various lower body ailments, primarily knee and foot issues. Secondly, three-time All-Star Brandon Roy would miss nearly half the season with knee injuries. And thirdly, the roster was pretty inconsistent as starters were dealt at the deadline as the front office tried desperately to piece together something healthy for a viable postseason run. The Blazers still managed to win 48 games even throughout all that. 
good enough for sixth in the conference. In this year's edition of round one, they would take on the Dirk Nowitzki-led Dallas Mavericks. In games one and two, the Mavericks were far too much for the Blazers to handle. Aldridge fought hard, scoring 27 and 24 respectively, but teammate Roy only managed two total points in Dallas. When the series went back to Portland, it looked like it was going to be a sweep, but somehow the Blazers dug deep and edged out a narrow victory in both games three and four. Game four was especially noteworthy, as even with Aldridge being off his A game, Roy stepped up to drop 24 to lead them to victory. In game five and six though, reality set back in for the Blazers as they would for the third year in a row lose in round one in six games. At least this go around was Aldridge's best playoff run, proving he was still improving every single year as he put up 20.7 boards and 1.7 blocks per game. Despite not making the All-Star team, Aldridge was named to the All-NBA third team for his efforts this year. As much as people want to be positive and generally optimistic about a player's abilities and their future, the fact of the matter is that durability could very well be the most important element of a basketball player when it comes to their ability to win a championship. Say what you will about guys like Chris Paul, Kawhi Leonard, Kyrie Irving, Blake Griffin, Kevin Durant, and the like. The reality is no matter how good these guys are or have been, injuries almost always derail them. And even superstar guys who people view as bus drivers or players that can carry teams to championships. LeBron James, for example, he can't win without a healthy Kevin Love and Kyrie. Stephen Curry can't win without a healthy Klay Thompson and Draymond. Kawhi Leonard can't win without a healthy Pascal Siakam and Kyle Lowry, and the list goes on. It doesn't matter how good your best player is, if you do not have a healthy big three essentially, you're not going to win. Aldridge, up to this point in his career, was proving to be an extremely reliable, near all-star level player, as through the past four years, he only sat out 10 games, and that is with a well-documented and serious heart condition. Even though Aldridge was not flashy and he has not been named an all-star, he earned himself a very good reputation around the league. But the lockout happened. Some of you may be too young to remember, but the 2012 NBA season did not start until Christmas Day, and a lot happened leading up to that day. Right before training camp, Brandon Roy announced his retirement from basketball, citing serious damage to his knees. It was a major shock to the basketball world as Roy was a young face of the league in the making. At only 26 years old, it appeared he had played his final NBA game. Meanwhile, the team's former number one overall pick, who I remind you was selected over Kevin Durant, Greg Oden, was set to miss his second consecutive entire season due to lower body injuries. This shortened season was not a good one for Portland as their roster experienced a lot of turnover and each player's role changed dramatically as time went on. The only consistent high-level player ended up being Aldridge. After only missing three games for most of the year, at the very end Aldridge would injure his hip and set out the final couple weeks of games. In this 2012 season, Aldridge finally would make his first All-Star game, though you could call it bittersweet. At 26 years old, he managed an impressive 21 points, 8 rebounds, and 2 assists a game. The Blazers struggled mightily all season long, winning only 28, finishing 11th in the conference. During the summer of 2012, though he recovered from his hip ailment in a timely manner, Aldridge would tear his meniscus prior to the Olympics. This caused him to miss out on what was probably the best opportunity he was going to have in his entire career to make the national team roster. Another low point in what was supposed to be the prime of his career. The 2013 NBA season was going to be Aldridge's second as the face of the Portland franchise without Roy there, but this year a certain someone would make his NBA debut. Thanks to the Blazers' awful 2012 season, they ended up with the sixth overall pick in that year's draft. And with it, they took an upperclassman, Damian Lillard. Aldridge, who let me remind you was only 27, was the grandpa on this year's version of the Blazers. He was the fourth oldest on the team, and he was the oldest amongst any of the regular rotation guys. Though the team wasn't necessarily tanking and trying to lose every game, they were not very competitive. Aldridge would end up playing in 74 games, another healthy season, and he managed the most impressive stat line of his career at 21 points, nine rebounds, two assists, and 1.2 blocks a game. He was the focal point of their offense 
and the anchor of their defense, although now he had some fresh meat to help him out a bit, although they still weren't producing a whole lot. Damian Lillard was playing well around the perimeter, Nicholas Batum was a pretty good young wing player, Wesley Matthews was a good shooter, and Myers Leonard was a big man. The future of the Blazers looked pretty promising, with a whole new young core, and Aldridge making his second All-Star team while leading them was a good sign. They finished with 33 wins, once again finishing 11th in the conference. The summer of 2013 marked the first time since 2006 that Aldridge was not named to the Team USA summer squad for even the select or training camp. There wasn't a tournament to be held that year, but still not being named was a bit of a letdown considering how long he had been working to make the team, and how he was playing at a level higher than he had ever before in his career. Nevertheless, Aldridge turned his focus to the 2014 season, and he had himself a pretty good year. The Blazers opened up the year winning 24 of their first 29 games. They were dominating the league thanks in large part to Aldridge and Lillard complementary playstyles as they were unstoppable on offense and they held their own on defense, at least inside. Lillard's not much of a defensive player. On December 12th against the Rockets, Aldridge became the first Blazer player in history to drop a 30.25 rebound game. Then on January 23rd, he had a career high in scoring putting up 44. This play led to both Aldridge making his third All-Star appearance as well as his teammate Lillard making his first. At the end of the regular season, Aldridge had managed to average a career-best 23 points and 11 rebounds per game. He was named to his second All-NBA third team as a result. Portland finished with 54 wins and once again was back in the playoffs as the fifth seed. This time, they would be facing off with the Houston Rockets in round one, a rematch of sort, although this time the Rockets were kind of completely different as they were led by James Harden and Dwight Howard. A battle of duo versus duo was what the series was headlined as, a guard and a big man. And game one opened up as a legendary game for the ages. Aldridge and Lillard combined to score 77 points as the Blazers barely came out on top by two. Then in Game 2, Aldridge once again showed up scoring himself another 40 plus point performance, helping his team go up 2-0. After dropping Game 3 back in Portland, they once again won another close one, led by Aldridge's 29 points and 4 blocks to take Game 3, to take a 3-1 lead. Game 5 was won by Houston, but Game 6 back in Portland was the dreaded barrier, the one that Aldridge had not yet been able to surpass, and he showed up to that game, scoring 30 points, grabbing 13 rebounds, and a win by one point to take the series. For the first time in his career, Aldridge, now playing alongside Lillard rather than Roy, was going to the second round. The San Antonio Spurs were a well-oiled machine, led by their well-known big three, Tim Duncan, Tony Parker, and Manu Ginobili. And they even now had a young newcomer, Kawhi Leonard, on their roster. No matter what Aldridge did in this series, the Blazers were no match. After dropping 32 points, 13 rebounds in Game 1 and a blowout loss, they quickly fell in an 0-3 hole. Despite a surprise Game 4 victory in front of their home crowd, the Blazers were stomped out in Game 5, thus ending another playoff run. In all, Aldridge managed to put up an impressive 26 points, 10 rebounds, and 1.6 blocks per game in 11 playoff games. During the summer of 2014, Aldridge opted to withdraw his name from the running to make the United States national team. Now, did he feel burnt out from playing so much, including every single summer? That's possible. Was he frustrated that he had not made the team after spending every single summer with the team? That's also possible. Or was he just trying to rest and get ready for the next NBA season? That's also possible. As has become tradition, the Blazers opened up the 2015 regular season sharp, winning 30 of their first 38 games. In January, Though Aldridge sustained a pretty serious thumb injury by tearing a ligament, which is not necessarily a debilitating type of injury, but it is one that causes significant pain and takes a very long time to recover from due to needing surgery. Initially, it was reported that Aldridge would have to miss six to eight weeks with the surgery, but he opted instead to hold off on the operation and play through the pain. A noble act indeed, but whether or not this is the right decision in the long run, it's usually not, although it doesn't seem to have affected his career very much. At the midway point of the year, once again, both Aldridge and Lillard were named All-Stars, making this Aldridge's fourth appearance. But in March, 
Starting shooting guard Wesley Matthews would rupture his Achilles tendon, forcing him to miss the rest of the year. His absence was a major contributor to the team losing 11 of their last 18 games. And in the end, the Blazers still finished with 51 wins, ranking 6 in the conference, but they entered the postseason very hobbled. Aldridge managed to average 23 points, 10 rebounds per game, and hit a career-high 37 three-point shots, now shooting a respectable 35% from deep. This year's playoffs were a tough one as they were both the lower seed and without one of their primary offensive options. But the team still fought hard against the grit and grind Zach Randolph, Mike Conley, Marcus All led Memphis Grizzlies. Here Aldridge had a pretty epic battle with Zebo and Gasol, two of the league's most physical and skilled low post players offensively and defensively. Despite great production in games 1-3 through three by Aldridge, the Blazers were down 0-3 playing game 4 in Portland. Here, they managed to slip away with an ugly victory before losing Game 5 and once again being first round losers. In this series, Aldridge averaged 21 points and a career high 11 rebounds and 2.4 blocks per game. Aldridge was also given his first All NBA Second Team award this season, but it ended up being another frustrating year. In the summer of 2015, Aldridge was a free agent, and up to this point, the 30 year old had amassed several All Stars and All NBAs while proving to be a monster when it comes to consistent 20 and 10 production and durability. Though he may not have been anyone's first option, pretty much every NBA team with cap space wanted to add him to their roster. Ultimately, it was the San Antonio Spurs in his home state of Texas who would win him over. Signing a four-year, $80 million contract, Aldridge was hoping to follow in the footsteps of Tim Duncan as he would take over to be the next generation of great Spurs centers. Although, keep in mind, Tim Duncan technically was still playing, so they shared the court. This Spurs team was an absolute machine in 2016. At the All-Star break, they had a staggering record of 45 wins and 8 losses. Aldridge made his fifth consecutive All-Star team, along with his teammate Kawhi Leonard making his first. But they didn't let up down the stretch either, as they finished the regular season with an otherworldly 67 wins, becoming the 13th team ever to amass so many victories. Now, funny enough, even with this accomplishment, they still only managed to be the second seed in the West, as this was that year that the Warriors won 73 games, breaking the all-time record. Aldridge, with his reduced role on this new team, still managed to put up 18 points, 8 rebounds a game, and he shot career highs of 52% on his twos and 85% from the foul line. Unfortunately though, right before the end of the regular season, Aldridge dislocated his finger on his shooting hand, which, though he didn't miss much time, this did bother him throughout the playoffs. In the first round, Aldridge was set to square up in a rematch of sort against the Grizzlies, although this time he was on a new team. But the Grizzlies were severely hobbled by injuries to their core, and as a result, they failed to put up much of a fight. The Spurs would win in four not close games. Aldridge only broke 26 minutes a single time. It was the second round where things got interesting. The Kevin Durant and Russell Westbrook-led Oklahoma City Thunder were a far more formidable opponent for the Spurs. Game 1 ended up being a monster blowout in favor of the Spurs, with Aldridge scoring 38 points, but Game 2, the script flipped as the Spurs would lose a nail-biter at the end despite Aldridge's 41. Game 3, San Antonio would once again re-establish control in another close one, this time led by Kawhi, but after this, the Thunder, they took off and didn't look back. OKC would win 3 games in a row, crushing the hopes and dreams of the Spurs faithful in 6. Another frustrating playoff loss, but you can't blame Aldridge. He averaged 21 points, 8 rebounds, 1.4 blocks per game, shooting 51% from 2 in the 10 games he played. He was what they could have hoped for, and he was given another All-NBA Third Team award for his efforts. But the Spurs were getting a bit old, so some changes were coming. In the summer of 2016, Tim Duncan retired from the NBA and the Spurs brought on another Hall of Fame caliber guy to fill in alongside Aldridge, this being Pau Gasol. The Spurs were one of the holdout teams when it came to three-point shooting, opting to run two classic big men, though both could sprinkle in a little bit of long-range shooting when need be. This year's Spurs were once again uber competitive. Kawhi took off and had the best season of his career at that point. Gasol, though not producing a ton, was still extremely effective at what he did do, and the team legitimately had 13 players who could play a valuable role on the floor. Don't believe me? Their 13th man was Kyle Anderson. 
This team once again rolled through the regular season, but in March, Aldridge experienced another bout of heart arrhythmia, aka regular heartbeat. And as a result, he was ruled out for an indefinite amount of time, but surprisingly, and thankfully, only four days later he was cleared to return to play. Although Aldridge missed making the All-Star team this year for the first time after five consecutive appearances, I don't think the Spurs or him were bothered. This was a very down-to-business franchise. For the regular season, Aldridge averaged 17 points, 7 rebounds per game, hitting 23 of 56 three-point shots, which is pretty stinking high at 41%. The Spurs finished with 61 wins, once again ranking them as the second seed in the conference. This year's postseason opened up with the Spurs once again going to battle against the Memphis Grizzlies, but this time, the Grizzlies were healthy. Games 1 and 2 at home were decisive blowouts, but when the series went to Tennessee, the Grizzlies stepped up, taking both games on their home floor. Concerningly, Aldridge was barely making a dent in this series against a combination of Zebo and Marcus All. Then in Game 5, though Aldridge again was quiet, the Spurs were able to squeak away with another victory. And finally in Game 6, back in Memphis, the Spurs were able to finish off the Grizzlies. Round 1 was dominated by Kawhi Leonard, but Round 2 he had a tough matchup with James Harden and the Houston Rockets. They were going to need Aldridge to step up. Game 1 was a major wake-up call as the Rockets blew the socks off the Spurs on their home floor. Thankfully though, the Spurs, Game 2 and 3, were right back in their favor. Aldridge came out clutch in Game 3, dropping 26 points and blocking 4 shots. But Game 4 was again another embarrassment as the Rockets won by a huge margin. The Rockets were not supposed to be whooping up on the Spurs. But after winning Game 5 at home, the Spurs, led by Aldridge, who dropped 34 points and 12 rebounds, were able to crush the Rocket to the tune of a 39-point blowout in Game 6. Next, the Spurs were on to the Conference Finals, the first time in Aldridge's career he'd make a playoff run this deep. And they had to face the league's best team, the Golden State Warriors, now featuring a shiny new Kevin Durant as a complement to their already stacked offensive duo of Stephen Curry and Klay Thompson while Draymond Green ran around the inside punching people. Game 1 was an epic battle. Aldridge managed a monstrous 28 points, but their team's best player, Kawhi Leonard, was undercut on a jump shot by the Warriors center Zaza Pachulia, resulting in a career-altering lower body injury that he still deals with to this day. Ultimately, thanks in large part to this, the Warriors squeaked out with the win. Games two through four were not close, and the Warriors ended up winning the series in four games. They went on to win their second championship in three years. It was a devastating loss for the Spurs and Aldridge as he had never been closer to reaching the summit of basketball as he was this year. Aldridge's 2017 playoff run was not as spectacular in the box store as it has been in the past, but at 31 years old, he was still pretty good, putting up 16.7 rebounds per game on a conference finals pushing team. The Spurs would never be the same after Kawhi Leonard's injury but they did their best to remain competitive, pretending everything was okay. During the summer of 2017, they opted to lock Aldridge down even longer than he was initially supposed to remain by giving him a three-year, $72 million extension. And though it may have been questionable to sign an aging classic big man to a long-term deal in the later 2010s, Aldridge played about as good as anyone could have hoped for while on this deal. In 2018, he took over the offense in the absence of Leonard. He picked up his production to a career-high 23 points per game, he grabbed 8 rebounds a game, and he still was blocking shots at 1.2 per game. He took over the full-time starting center minutes this year, no longer playing the four, as the Spurs team modernized a bit to a more perimeter-capable team. Aldridge would make his third All-Star team this year, but even with his improved play, the Spurs were just not nearly as competitive this year as they were hoping to be. This was in large part due to Kawhi only appearing in nine games during the regular season before being shut down due to continuous pain in his injured leg. The Spurs veterans were finally too old, and their young players just not quite there yet. They would win 47 games and finish 7th in the conference. To make things worse, their first round opponent was the championship hungry Golden State Warriors, who just absolutely embarrassed them in this series, winning in 5. Aldridge dropped 23 points, 9 rebounds in that series, but it just wasn't really very competitive. The cherry on top of this disappointing Sunday of a season was Aldridge making the All-NBA second team for the second time of his career. 
The 2019 NBA season was another weird one for the San Antonio Spurs. It was a bit of an in-between year. They were trying to be win now by swapping Kawhi Leonard with DeMar DeRozan, but I'm not so sure that just DeRozan and Aldridge is enough to be competitive. This season, they both averaged 21 points per game with DeMar dishing six assists a game and Aldridge grabbing nine boards a night. Questionably, DeRozan was snubbed from the All-Star game, but Aldridge did make his seventh All-Star appearance. On January 10th, Aldridge had his career-high 56 points in a game against the Thunder, but in the end, despite some highs, the Spurs ended up with only 48 wins. It was a bit of a disappointment. In the first round, they would face the young Denver Nuggets, led by a 23-year-old first-time All-Star Nikola Jokic and a 21-year-old Jamal Murray. We know that today this pair is quite good, but back in 2019, they were mere children compared to the 33-year-old Aldridge and 29-year-old DeRozan. In a battle between old school and new school, Game 1 opened up with the old heads taking a 15-point win on the Nuggets' home floor. But in Game 2, the Nuggets bounced back in a battle of the big fellas, with Jokic dropping a 21-point, 13-rebound, 8-assist dazzler against Aldridge's 24-8. Game 3 back in Texas went to the Spurs, but in Game 4, the Nuggets once again walked away victors. Game 5 in Denver was a tough one to walk into, and the Spurs stood little chance, especially with Aldridge dealing with foul trouble as they got blown out. But back at home in Game 6, they refused to die, as Aldridge gave his best Jokic impression, dropping 25 points, grabbing 10 boards, and dishing out 5 assists. Ultimately, it came down to Game 7. Denver would barely get away with a four-point win, knocking the Spurs for the second straight year out of the playoffs in the first round. Another year, another playoff letdown for Aldridge and his team. In 2020, Aldridge was right back to doing what everyone knew he was capable of for the Spurs, as he went through the motions to once again trying to be competitive. Through 53 games, he had amassed an average of 18 points, 7 rebounds a night with a career high, 61 made threes on a 38% clip. Aldridge had proven he could adapt his game to the modern style. But in 2020, the pandemic happened, which put an early end to the regular season. As a result, he took the opportunity to have a major shoulder surgery he had been putting off to relieve some chronic pain he had been dealing with for years. The Spurs only won 32 games, they did not get invited to the bubble. Returning from surgery may have been tougher for Aldridge and his camp than they initially anticipated, as his play was pretty poor in the first half of the year. Combined with a few smaller injuries also derailing him, it resulted in him just being moved out of the starting lineup, as through 21 games, he was only putting up 13 points, 4 boards a night. With this decreased role and the Spurs team just flat out not being competitively viable, the two parties mutually agreed to a buyout so that Aldridge could go elsewhere and try to compete for a championship. Now at 35 years old, it seemed Aldridge understood he was no longer an all-star caliber big man in the league. He definitely still had value, but it was going to be in a lesser role, and understandably, he only wanted to play that lesser role for a contender. After a brief three days of being a free agent in March of 2021, Aldridge signed a rest of the year contract with the Brooklyn Nets, a super team featuring Kyrie Irving, James Harden, and Kevin Durant. On paper, they had appeared to be the league's best team, but in reality, personal egos and injuries derailed them drastically. Still though, Aldridge signed on under the impression they would be putting away all their issues and focus on a playoff run to win a championship. Through five games, Aldridge actually looked better than I think most people were expecting. As the fourth option in the starting lineup with three superstars, he managed an extremely efficient 12 points a night, including a 22 point performance and a victory over the Hornets. However, on April 15th, it was announced that due to health complications from his heart condition, Aldridge would need to retire immediately. This news came as a shock to the NBA world, as Aldridge has dealt with his heart issue his entire career, and he had been extremely sharp and missed so few games, but the human body is a complicated thing. Doctors explained it was either rest or potentially death, and Aldridge made the right decision. In the postseason, the Nets couldn't keep it together as they would fail to make the finals. Aldridge and his basketball career seemed like it was over. But then to the surprise of everyone, it was announced that Aldridge had been medically cleared to return for basketball in 2022. The Nets immediately re-signed him as they tried to run it back with their big three, but drama absolutely dominated their team all year long. Primarily Kyrie Irving being a cancer off the floor. 
But that's not what we're here to talk about. It got so bad James Harden demanded the trade, and in return they got stuck with the lame horse that is Ben Simmons. Aldridge did Aldridge things this year with all the chaos surrounding him, putting up 12 points, 5 rebounds a night, shooting a career high 57% on his twos. But surprisingly, despite all this drama, the Nets won 44 games, and they were able to make the playoffs. But disappointingly, for some reason, Aldridge got nothing but DNPs in the postseason. He was forced to watch the Nets lose in four games to the Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown led Boston Celtics. After this game, we never saw Aldridge on an NBA court again. He sat at home and watched this past 2023 season come and go before announcing his retirement in March 31st, 2023. His NBA career is now officially over. So let's look back at the accomplishments and the numbers as a quick refresher before we ask our final question today. Aldridge played in the NBA for 16 seasons. In that time, he made seven All-Star games, five All-NBA appearances, and was named to his All-Rookie first team. Aldridge appeared in 1,076 regular season games, enough to rank him 101st all-time. He blocked 1,187 shots ranking him 66th all-time. He grabbed 8,736 rebounds, good enough also for 66th all-time. And he scored 20,558 points, which places him right at 50th all-time. So what do you guys think? Aldridge definitely has had a remarkable career that most players would beg to get to experience. And he made a lot of money, he got to play a lot of basketball, and he had a lot of success while doing it. I think he had a good career. And here's some food for thought for you. Every player within the top 50 all-time scoring is either already in the Hall of Fame or is currently an active player but is pretty much a sure thing for the Hall of Fame. But just outside the top 50, there are a lot of guys who are not Hall of Famers. So Aldridge is quite literally right there on the border. He could be the highest scoring player ever to not make the Hall of Fame, or he can make it. It's a tough decision to make. And I know a lot of people are gonna to point to the championships or the lack thereof as a reason for him not to make it. But again, let me remind you, Aldridge has never been the problem. If you take Stephen Curry and give him an injured Kevin Durant every single time that he should have won a championship and an injured Clay that one year without Kevin, actually the two years without Kevin, We've already seen it. Stephen Curry can't win without those guys next to him. If you take LeBron James and make LeBron hurt that one year that they won a championship with the Cavs, or not LeBron, but Kyrie hurt that one year that they won a championship with the Cavs and say he doesn't join Chris Bosh and Dwayne Wade. LeBron is still LeBron, but he wouldn't have won a championship. Kawhi Leonard is an amazing player. He had one healthy postseason run with the Raptors where they were able to go all the way with Siakam and Lowry helping him out. And before that, he was just the fourth option role guy with the Spurs. A lot of people put so much focus on championship rings when deciding a player's worth, but I, I disagree with that mentality. I think LaMarcus Aldridge has had a Hall of Fame worthy career. I know he is not the flashiest guy. I know he doesn't have the hardware, but in my opinion, he had a Hall of Fame career. Thank you guys for watching the video. This was definitely a long one, so I really do appreciate it if you've made it up to this point. Please let me know down below what you guys think of his career and whether or not you think he's gonna go to the Hall of Fame someday. Tell me why or why not, and also let me know other players you think are worthy of a deep dive investigation. Players right on the border. Comment, like, subscribe. I will see you all next time.